Mark 3, 20 says, Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. So they called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Surely I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. And his brothers and his mothers came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that Jesus has called us to be his brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have in Christ. When we believe upon him, we're forgiven of our sins. Are brought into family relationship with the Lord Almighty. That's an amazing thing. Thank you so much for your grace that you've given us. We pray that you would teach us through your word, that you would help us see Jesus, that all this morning long, not just during our worship, but even as we study your word, we would have an encounter with the living God today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been slandered? Most likely, all of us have been spoken badly about at some point in the past, and I can say that with uh, some uh, just assurance just for the fact that we all did go to elementary school, and at some time, you're going to be spoken badly about. But slander is in a different category altogether. When someone's slandered, the language is defamatory, and actually, legal action can be pursued if somebody's reputation is just irreparably damaged. Sometimes, of course, the damage is done, and there's really not much that can be done to fix it, no matter what the courts may or may not decide, which, by the way, is one of the dangers of gossip and why Christians should not engage in it, because falsehoods spread much farther and faster than the truth ever will. But what the text shows us here is that the scribes engage in slander. They've seen Jesus at work, and they can't bear to think of the conclusion that Jesus actually might be the Son of God. So they decide to slander Jesus instead. They need some excuse not to believe in Jesus. They need some excuse to get other people not to believe in Jesus. And so this is what they grasped onto. And in the process, they're going to go down a road that brings eternal consequences. And Jesus was warning them of that. Now, if that was the scribes, then Jesus' own family didn't do much better. Now, they may not have slandered him, but they seem to have questioned Jesus' sanity. They're not sure what's going on, and they're trying to pull them away from the ministry. In the end, it's the disciples and strangers that were desperately looking to Jesus in faith. These were the people that Jesus considered his true family. And so it's worth us asking as we get started, what is your reaction to Jesus? Is it belief or is it blasphemy? Is it simple faith or is it slander? So let's look at this together. Mark chapter 3, starting verse 20. Then the multitude came together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. So we had left Jesus, you might recall, with his disciples. Jesus had been up on a mountain all night in prayer. He had called his disciples to himself uh, from a, a seemingly larger group. Jesus named 12 of those to be his apostles. Remember apostles is just a word that means the sent out ones. He commissioned them to go spread the news about him, basically to be his ambassadors. He named 12, including Judas Iscariot, of course, the man who would betray him to death. And that's where we left off last time. 
From there they came off the mountain, came down off the mountain, and went into a house. And that's how chapter 3, verse 19 ended, or perhaps chapter uh, 3, verse 20 began, depending on your translation. Presumably, all 12 apostles were with Jesus at that time, though perhaps not quite everybody who believed in Jesus as a disciple. It's unlikely that all of them would have been able to fit into to one house together, but that's where they came to. That's where we left them. Now, at this point, we're not exactly sure how much time has passed, but their alone time, whatever alone time they did have, was ended. All these crowds now have started gathering together again. Crowds always had a tendency of congregating around Jesus. This one's turning out to be particularly large. Remember, when Jesus was teaching by the Sea of Galilee, he had arranged a version of crowd control and that a boat was going to be kept at the ready at all times. So when the multitude got too large, he'd be able to step into the boat and teach from offshore. And that would prevent him and from anyone else, of course, from being crushed by the amount of people that were pressing in around him. This time, though, they're not at the seashore. There's no boat at the ready. So now we see what's going on, and this is the very thing that Jesus was making plans to avoid. So many people pressing in that movement was impossible. Mark says here there were so many that they could not so much as eat bread. They couldn't gather around a table. You almost get a picture that they couldn't even move their hands up to their mouth to eat, right? That's a lot of people that have gathered together in this one place, which goes to tell us something. There are a lot of reactions people have to Jesus, and we'll see many of this in our text But surely a good one is this. There is this desperation to be around Jesus. There's this desperation to be with him. Now, no doubt, there are many in the crowds who didn't know the the truth of who Jesus was. Obviously. Uh, Surely a large percentage, perhaps even a majority, did not yet have a, a saving faith. But even if there was a small percentage in this crowd who were there, they were still desperate to reach out and see Jesus they were seeking Jesus in faith, that's good. These people wanted to be with him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to experience whatever it was that Jesus was doing. And that's a good thing. They were desperate. You know, and we think about this multitude and it had a mix of people there, people of faith, people without faith. What does it say that this entire group of people that were so desperate to be around Jesus and yet so many people today who actively claim to love Jesus and to have been saved by him sometimes we seem to be so apathetic towards him. It's as if we're grateful for Jesus' promises, salvation, but other than that, you know, take him or leave him. doesn't matter whether or not we gather together with other Christians, it's just another church service rather than an active encounter with the living God. It doesn't matter if we actually engage in worship, it's just a bunch of singing rather than glorifying the Creator with our hearts and our minds. Where is the desperation of the church to be with the Lord God who saved us? And that's what they're showing here. They're desperate. Verse 21, but when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. So not everyone was excited to be around Jesus and to see what he was doing. Some were disturbed by the attention Jesus was attracting, including what his own people. Now, the obvious question is this, who are these people who are described as Jesus's own people? Now, although some translations go ahead and describe this as family, the ESV, the HCSB, the NIV, I'll say that, that's an interpretation rather than a direct translation of the text. But we do need to acknowledge this. It is an informed interpretation. Uh, Beginning in verse 31, there's no doubt that Jesus' own blood relatives were among those who tried to seize, to lay hold of Jesus here. And the words that actually are translated, his own people, It seems to have been an idiom that sometimes used to refer to families, and his family was certainly involved here, even if the group was perhaps a bit broader that came out from Nazareth. It's his friends and family coming to grab hold of him. Well, what was the problem? They thought he was insane. His own family and friends from Nazareth went to where he was teaching in Capernaum, most likely, to apprehend Jesus and to drag him back to Nazareth. Why? Because they said he's out of his mind. Now, it is possible that his friends and family were so concerned for Jesus when they heard of the crowds, because those crowds gathered everywhere, and how much Jesus was working, he couldn't even eat. Perhaps they were fearful that Jesus was endangering himself. But the phrase does typically refer to insanity. Either way, the conclusion isn't good. Either Jesus' family believed that he didn't know what he was doing to himself, or they believed that he was outright nuts. Now, consider that for a moment. 
fallen creation believe that the Creator was crazy. So lost is mankind in our sin that humans, we can't even recognize the difference between sanity and insanity, but we're the ones who have everything turned upside down. We're the ones that hold on to certain sins thinking that they're good for us. We're the ones that have given ourselves over to the things of darkness that people can't you know, distinguish right from wrong, yet people thought Jesus was the crazy one. By the way, uh, his family came, and we know from later on Mary was there. We're not specifically told if Mary held this opinion as well, but there's no doubt she was among them, verse 31 and 32. If anyone knew the truth about Jesus, it was Mary. You notice Joseph isn't mentioned at this point. Perhaps he was dead. We don't know. But either the family didn't believe Mary's testimony about Jesus or she was having some doubts of her own. Either way, some things are going on in her life here. This isn't the first time that people from Nazareth had a problem with Jesus early in Jesus' ministry when he claimed that Isaiah's messianic prophecies were being fulfilled right in front of their eyes. People attempted to kill Jesus at that time. Luke 4, chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. They couldn't believe that the son of the local carpenter had the gall to claim the things that he did about himself, so they tried to stone him. How could this guy you know, be the one upon whom the hope of Israel rested? He'd grown up with them for uh, you know, years. They'd gone to synagogue with this guy. They probably went to his bar mitzvah. They, for him to be saying these things about himself would have been considered blasphemous and crazy. And if it had been anyone else saying these things, they'd have been absolutely right. It is crazy for someone to claim that they're the Messiah, the Son of God. For someone who believes himself to be God is delusional at best and is in dire need of mental help. And all of that's true if the person isn't Jesus. But when Jesus claimed these things about himself, he was speaking the truth. And he proved that he was speaking the truth through his supernatural miracles. And in fact, that was the point of all the miracles. The point of the miracles wasn't to entertain people with a show. It wasn't to give people an emotional high so everybody feels good about themselves. It was to demonstrate to people the power, the authority, and the glory of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. The miracles of God were authenticating Jesus as a son of God and all authenticated his claims about himself. By the way, today the same is still true. When people have doubts about Jesus, all we need to do is look at his miracles, and one miracle in particular, the resurrection. The historical, factual resurrection of Jesus proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is exactly whom he claimed to be. Without it, we'd have good reason to doubt either Jesus' truthfulness or his sanity. But with it, we cannot question his deity. He absolutely is who he says he is. His miracles prove it. And because Jesus' miracles authenticated his claims, it was the miracles that people tried to attack. Look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he cast out demons. Now, there's a bit of context here that seems to have been left unsaid by Mark. Both Matthew and Luke affirm that Jesus was casting out a demon at the time of this accusation. So this wasn't coming out of nowhere, and we'll read Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. All the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? And this incredible display of God-given power, people did exactly as they were supposed to do. This miracle had the intended effect. They were looking at Jesus as perhaps being the Messiah. After all, this man now has demonstrated he's got authority over the spiritual realms, so surely he's endued with a kind of authority that would only be expected of the Son of David, the King of Israel, the one promised by God. Now, his own family didn't believe the signs that Jesus was doing, but it seemed evident to the strangers, at least, who surrounded him of what was going on. And so now the religious leaders are there, and once they see what's going on, now they understand they've got to do something. And notice who came. It was the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. Now, if you look at the parallel account of Matthew, you'll see that there was the Pharisees that brought up the accusation. If you look at the parallel account in Luke, it doesn't identify the accusers of Jesus. Well, which one is it? Well, it's both and all. The Pharisees, of course, were constantly working against Jesus, as were the scribes, and apparently there were some scribes who made the trip from Jerusalem with much of the rest of the crowd that came back in verse 8 of chapter 3. 
And they had joined with the Pharisees in the same accusation. And as they grumbled, it had been very easy for the rumor to spread through the skeptics in the crowd. Now, regarding the scribes themselves, Mark makes a point of identifying them of having come from Jerusalem. So it's likely an indication of their authority. So think of it. These were the bigwigs in town, right? These were the scholars from the very prestigious centers in Jerusalem. They had come to check out Jesus for themselves, and they were not thrilled with what they saw. They were scholarly. They were educated. They were versed of the scriptures. They ought to have been overjoyed at what they saw because they saw the fulfillment of prophecy right before their eyes. See, more than most Jews, even more than the Pharisees, the scribes were the true religious scholars of Israel. They would have known the scriptures backwards and forwards. They were lawyers. They would have been well familiar with the prophecies that surrounded the Messiah. They should have known the time was at hand for the Messiah to appear, according to the 70-week prophecy in Daniel. They would have recognized the authority and the message of the most important prophet in all of Israel's history so far, which was John the Baptist. And now, here Jesus was, standing right before their eyes. He's doing miracles. He's showing himself stronger than Satan in every respect. That ought to have been reason for them to rejoice, but instead they scoffed and they made excuses. People still do this today. They hear the wonderful message of the gospel, how they can be freely forgiven by God. They understand the sinfulness of their sin when confronted by the scriptures, when confronted by the witness of the Holy Spirit. Their heart is cut to the quick when they realize their need for Christ. And yet what happens? So many times they scoff, they harden their heart, and they turn away. They see who Jesus is, but they're not willing to believe upon him as Lord. And as long as they, you know, they can remain the master of their own life, they believe they're happy, they're, they're better off, but in reality, they're doomed. Uh, they make excuses to try to make themselves feel better. We need to stop the excuses. If you see who Jesus is, then you need to respond to him. You need to surrender your life to Jesus in faith, believing upon him as Lord. The only way to actually receive his forgiveness is to act upon what Jesus, God has revealed to be true. The scribes, the Pharisees, they came up with their excuse. They they found a way to implant doubt in the minds of the people in the crowd. Now, strategically, they didn't really have a, if I could speak, I could get this point out. Strategically, they didn't really have too many other options. After all, Jesus had a constant ministry of casting out demons. And what he did was repeatedly witnessed by others, and it simply could not be denied. The work he did was too public. It was too evident. People were being healed. Demons were being cast out. This wasn't illusion. This wasn't sleight of hand. This wasn't entertainment. This was reality. The the religious leaders needed a way to discredit Jesus in light of this reality. Remember, they have been plotting together for some time to destroy Jesus, back in verse 6 of chapter 3. Now they thought they had their chance. They couldn't deny what was going on, so they start a whispering campaign instead. Why address Jesus directly when you can just slander his miraculous work? Jesus' power is undeniable. It's evident to all, so you cast doubts on the source of his power. Basically, they accuse Jesus of being in league with Satan. Beelzebub seems to have been a derogatory name that the Jews used for the god of Ekron uh, that had been worshipped in the area years and years ago, uh, sometimes by the Jews themselves. Uh, But loosely it's translated to be Lord of the Flies. But anyway, there's no doubt that they were referring to the chief of demons, Satan. By the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. In other words, it wasn't by the power of God that Jesus was casting out demons from the people. This was a gigantic ruse of the devil, the ruler of the demonic realm. They accused Jesus of being a tool of Satan to trick the people. If Satan was the one giving Jesus his power, then people were putting their trust in a demonic ruse. They were being deceived. Now question, how exactly can Jesus refute that? After all, the scribes and the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of spiritual deception and treason. This is something that couldn't be witnessed. This is something that couldn't be verified by anyone on the outside. You know, the true spiritually enlightened scholars of Israel, they could see the deception, but it might not be so obvious to the rest of the crowd. So, you know, those scholars, they were just doing their best to warn people away from something that was truly dangerous. 
So it would seem that the scribes and the Pharisees, they've got a winning hand here. How can a slanderous charge be refuted when there's no visible way of proving it? It's a he said, he said scenario. How do you know which one to trust? Whether people trust the upstart prophet or would they trust the religious leaders that had always guided them before? What they needed to solve all this was a word of wisdom from God. And of course, that's exactly what God the Son is going to provide for them. By the way, real quick, there is a spiritual gift identified in the New Testament as a word of wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Basically, it's an answer given by the Holy Spirit at just the right time in just the right way. Something that demonstrates the wisdom of God that can't be matched by the wisdom and the arguments of man. Sometimes all of our arguments are just that, empty wind and arguments. And we'll go round and round and round without finding a right solution to the problem. What's needed is supernatural wisdom. And in the word of wisdom, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit gives. It's a gift that Christians probably ought to be praying for more often. Anyway, verse 23. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now, we will see some, but Mark doesn't record a whole bunch of parables from Jesus. He does record a few, two of which are here as Jesus gives us a word of wisdom. Jesus may not be able to physically show the source of his authority. After all, it's not like God gives out uh, you know, supernatural decrees that you can hand out identification cards with. Besides, Jesus doesn't need that. He's God. He inherently has authority. But he can definitely show them the foolishness of their thinking. First parable is this, division. Division is an indication of trouble, not success. Demons were being cast out. Not in a grand deception, not in a show. Demons were being cast out in reality. How could Satan do this against himself? When a kingdom wars against itself, we don't think of that as successful. In fact, we have a specific name for it. It's a civil war. Tragedy happens. Civil wars, more people die in civil wars than they do when they're warring against other nations. A household that's divided against itself, we call that dysfunctional, not a success story. When division is sown, destruction is the result. And we see that in everyday examples. By the way, this is one reason division is so harmful among Christians. When Christians start tearing one another down, we're actually working against ourselves. We are part, what, of the body of Christ, And to engage in division with one another, it's like two hands stabbing at each other or punching yourself in the gut. It's always destructive, and that's the point that he was making here. It's always destructive, no matter who you're talking about. So verse 26, and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. What's true of earthly houses and earthly kingdoms is true of spiritual houses and spiritual kingdoms. Satan is indeed a ruler. He's a ruler of demons. He's the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. And yet, like any other created being, he's limited. Satan does not have infinite resources. He does not have unlimited power. Uh, He has, rather, uh, uh, limited power. He has to work with what he's got in order to do what he needs to do. What's he want to do? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10, and that's it. So how could Satan release people from the grip of his demons and then still expect his kingdom to expand? He's committing civil war against himself if he's doing that. He'd bring down his own kingdom. Now, the devil may be a lot of things, but he's certainly smarter than that. When he's got somebody in his grip, he doesn't easily let go. When Jesus cast out the demons, there's no doubt that Jesus was tearing down the kingdom of Satan. He truly released people from the power of the devil. They were truly free. This isn't something Satan would do, even in deception. If you're going to use a common phrase today, that would be cutting off your nose to spite your face. He'd be bringing an end to himself. Now, to be sure, Satan does have an end. And we know that when we read the end of the book of Revelation. However, he doesn't bring it upon himself. When Satan goes to his final end, he's thrown into the lake of fire. It's because Jesus threw him there, not because he jumped in of his own accord. He goes in verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds a strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Here's the second parable, plundering the strong man. And we've got to remember, and we'll review this next week as well, a parable is not an allegory. 
A parable is a general illustration used to make a point. When Jesus gives the parable of plundering, he's using a scenario that's more easily attributed to villains than heroes. After all, we don't typically think of Jesus engaging in forcible entry, assault, and armed robbery, and yet that's all that's described here, right? We need to look at the point Jesus is making. Since he has been accused of being possessed by Satan and using demonic power, Jesus gives them a scenario of evil, just adopting their reasoning. If Jesus, in fact, was doing what he did by the power of the devil, then Jesus would be going to war against another agent of the devil and plundering what had already belonged to the devil. He'd be overpowering the one who supposedly empowered him. And that's impossible. The only way Jesus could overpower the devil is if Jesus has more power than the devil. And he does. Jesus is infinitely more powerful than the devil. Over time, our culture is bought into this false notion that God and Satan are somehow equally matched. They go to war against one another. You know, they come out fight. We just don't know who's going to win. Wrong. A thousand times wrong. God is stronger than the devil. God is the creator. Satan is just another created being. To be sure, Satan's a powerful created being. Much more powerful than humans. He's got a lot under his control. But he is limited by definition because he is created. And he was created by God. Jesus can plunder the devil because Jesus is God. Now, cults would have us believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers, but that's not at all what the Bible shows. Satan is infinitely less than Jesus because Jesus is the creator God. Jesus, then, is stronger than this strong man, and he has absolutely no problem plundering the house. When Jesus frees someone from the grip of Satan, they're truly free. When the Holy Spirit indwells a person at salvation, Satan's demons cannot come back in and repossess the person. Why? Because God is stronger. Satan can't plunder what belongs to God. But God can certainly plunder what had belonged to Satan. Verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation. So here's the conclusion he's coming to. The scribes were stepping into something they could not possibly understand. Their accusation against Jesus was horrific, and if they persisted in this, it would bring about eternal consequences that they were not even considering. And Jesus solemnly warns them about a sin so bad there would be no forgiveness from God, and that's the very sin that the scribes were in danger of committing. Now, there's actually very good news and very bad news here. So let's look at the good news first. The good news is this. All sins can be forgiven. All sins. Every single one. There are so many people that hesitate asking Jesus for forgiveness because they think they might have gone too far and surely God would never forgive somebody like them. There are many Christians who carry around burdens of guilt for years on end, knowing in their head that God promised forgiveness, but not really believing it in their heart. After all, they think, you know, there was that one sin that was so heinous, so bad, that although Jesus forgave everything else in their life, he couldn't forgive that. And that's not so. Those who come to Jesus in faith are forgiven all. Every sin our hands have committed, every blasphemy our tongue has uttered, Every single thing that we had done in rebellion against God, what will be forgiven by God when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the glorious good news Jesus brings. The Son of God come to reconcile mankind back to God. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ because he grants us true and complete forgiveness. When Jesus shed his blood for us at the cross, every sin was covered. Our forgiveness is complete and total. That's awesome news. That's a great place for an amen. amen. There we go. Awesome news. That's the good news. Well, what's the bad news? There is one sin that never has forgiveness. When someone comes to a final conclusion that blasphemes the Holy Spirit, that's a sin that lasts into eternity. Begs the question, what's blasphemy? The word we have in English is just a transliteration from the Greek. 
What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is slander. It's abusive speech. If someone was to speak lies about another person today, that's slandering their reputation. That's the idea here with this sin. Blasphemy can sometimes be thought of disrespect, but what Jesus describes here is more than disrespect. It's abusive slander. Saying that the Spirit-filled Son of God didn't have the Holy Spirit, but instead had Satan, that slander against the Spirit of God. Because you're calling the Holy Spirit Satan. There's no doubt that what Jesus did was done by the power of the one true almighty God. And the scribes and the Pharisees just labeled that God as Beelzebub. Jesus didn't come directly out and say that they had committed the unpardonable sin. He said, if you do this. But he definitely warns them that's exactly what they are in danger of doing. And for this, there is no forgiveness. This person is subject to eternal condemnation or according to other manuscripts, guilty of an eternal sin. Different Greek words, but exactly the same result. How can this be? Jesus just said, all sins, all blasphemies will be forgiven. How can this one sin, this one blasphemy, remain unforgiven? Well, it comes down to the nature of the sin. Think about it. A person cannot be forgiven by God if he or she doesn't even recognize a God who forgives. How can a person receive the forgiveness of Jesus if he believes that Jesus is an agent of Satan? They can't be forgiven because they never come to faith. If someone cannot believe the truth about God, and that person comes to the final slanderous conclusion that Jesus is not God, but rather filled with the devil instead of the Holy Spirit, that's a conclusion that will forever keep them outside of the forgiveness of God. In verse 30, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Do not miss this last part. That's the key to the rest of the text in verses 28 and 29. The Bible makes it absolutely clear why Jesus warned the scribes and the Pharisees of the unpardonable sin. They accused Jesus of having a demon. They attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to the work of Satan. The scribes and the Pharisees, they had seen the work of God with their own eyes. They knew God was at work. They just didn't want to admit it. They knew Jesus had seemingly unlimited power to heal and to cast out demons. Remember, they tested how far Jesus was willing to go with his power on a Sabbath day. There was no question that he could heal. They're setting up a situation that he would do it. They just didn't like everything that Jesus taught that accompanied his miracles. They didn't likely believe their own accusation against them. They're just saying whatever they can in an attempt to discredit Jesus. What they didn't realize is they were stepping into territory that would leave them forever condemned if they weren't careful. You know, so many people worry if they've committed the unpardonable sin. And they worry about words that they would have spoken rashly in the past, wondering if God would ever forgive them. If someone is looking to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness, then according to this definition here, they haven't committed that sin because they aren't looking to Jesus as a demonically possessed agent of Satan. If you're looking to Jesus as God, willing to forgive, then by definition, you have not done what the scribes did here. This is the reason Jesus gave them the warning. Doubts are not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Flippant words from an atheist saying, I don't believe, that's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. After all, for an atheist point of view, if you don't believe in demons, how can you believe Jesus is being possessed by a demon? Doesn't make sense at all. Religious leaders are more in danger of walking into this sort of blasphemy than non-believers when they attribute the things of God to the things of the devil. And that's exactly who Jesus was warning here. If you're looking to Jesus as the Son of God, if you're looking to Jesus as the one who is perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're someone who believes the testimony of the Holy Spirit about Jesus, then on the authority of the Word of God, you know that you aren't engaging in the unpardonable sin. What does that mean? It means that God's forgiveness is available for every other sin you have committed. So you can believe upon Jesus today and receive that forgiveness that he offers. Verse 31, Then his mother, excuse me, then his brothers and his mother came, standing outside, they went to, sent to him, calling him, and the multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. So with the slanderous accusation of the scribes and Pharisees answer, the attention now comes back to the friends and the family who first came out from Nazareth in verses 20 and 21. 
Uh, they were presumably standing on the outside of the house, unable to get to Jesus. Too many people were there, and they just can't squeeze in to take him away. So they start calling for him. And the crowd that's on the inside just passed along the news that his family had come. And by the way, do note that who came? His mothers, his brothers, and his mother. Very plain in the Greek. Uh, no, no qualifications on it of any sort. There's absolutely no reason to believe the text doesn't mean what it clearly states. Contrary to those who teach the perpetual virginity of Mary, the Bible plainly teaches that Jesus had brothers. Now, his brothers did not always have faith, and if you've got a brother or sister, that's completely understandable. Not too many of us would believe that the sibling we grew up with was divine. They had their own doubts. They even made fun of Jesus along the way, John chapter 7. But Jesus' death and resurrection changed that for at least some of them to the point that at least two of Jesus' brothers come to faith. They provide leadership for the church and even pen letters in the New Testament, James and Jude. Remember the reason they had come. They believed Jesus was out of his mind. Again, whether they believed Jesus was insane or just endangering himself, that's not made clear. But it's obvious they were trying to stop Jesus in the middle of his ministry. Here Jesus was, he's teaching the word of God, he's casting out demons, and his own family comes to take him away from the midst of it, and even his mother Mary tries to do the same thing. She's in on it. Have you ever felt abandoned by your family for the sake of Jesus? When you came to faith in Christ, did your friends and family think that you were crazy? What were you doing? You're not alone. It even happened with Jesus. Verse 33, but he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brother's? And he looked around in a circle of those who sat about him and said, Here are my, brother, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Can you imagine the scene? So many people have crowded around Jesus earlier that they didn't have room to eat. It, perhaps it was the 12 disciples who encircled Jesus to give him a little breathing room to teach, but whatever it was, there was now a circle, and he's actively engaged with the people all around him. When word comes to him about the family on the outside, one would think... He'd drop what he's doing and dutifully go outside. Or perhaps he'd bring them into a place of honor among the rest, and Jesus does neither. He doesn't even recognize them as his own family, but rather he recognizes all the people who are sitting around him. He recognizes those who have faith. At that moment, not even Jesus' own family had faith in what he was doing. They were trying to pull him away from the ministry to which God the Father had called him, and Jesus knew better than to obey that. Even if his mother and brothers had the best of intentions, their desire to stop Jesus from what he was doing has the same basic effect as what Satan had tempted Jesus to do in the wilderness, to just leave it all behind, give up the work of God. And Jesus wasn't about to do it. What his family was asking him to do was not born out of faith. There wasn't a hint of faith in it, no matter what they might have believed otherwise. But the people around Jesus were hanging on his every word. They were the ones acting upon the things that Jesus was saying. They were doing the will of God. They were his true family. They were his brother and sister and mother. Those who have an active faith have been brought into a saving relationship with Jesus. But it's better than just any relationship. We've been made family with Jesus. We don't have blood kinship, but we have something better. We have the declaration of God. We have the spirit of adoption that we are the joint heirs and siblings of Christ Jesus. And this is why John writes in his prologue, chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we believed, and by believing Jesus, we're doing the will of God because that is God's will, is to believe on him whom he has sent. When we do that will, then at that instant, we are made God's own children. We are born of the Spirit. We're brought into the family of Jesus. That's amazing. Think about who you were. Think about what you deserved. Then think about what you've actually received in Christ. That's beyond description. That's grace of the highest, highest magnitude. Some people were so desperate to be around Jesus and they had an active, living faith in Jesus and his word. Others, particularly his own family, had doubts about Jesus, fearful that he might be losing his mind. 
the scribes and the Pharisees went so far as to suggest that demon Jesus was uh, demonic. He caused a variety of reactions among the people. What's yours? Now, doubts are natural. Good people have doubts. That's to be expected from time to time. The fact that even Mary seemed to have some doubts, that really ought to be somewhat encouraging to the rest of us. She had seen more than the rest, and even the things of life for her seemed to have gotten in the way somewhat. What isn't natural is division and slander. If anything is demonic, it's that. Satan is the father of lies, and if he can get people to lie about the testimony of the Holy Spirit regarding Jesus, then things probably can't get too much better from his point of view. Don't believe the lies. Don't give in to the deception. What Jesus does is far more powerful than Satan. Why? Because Jesus is infinitely more powerful than Satan. Jesus is God himself indwelt and empowered by God the Holy Spirit, and the work he does speaks for itself. To look at the miraculous freeing work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus and then libel it as an act of Satan is slanderous to the highest extent. The good news is that those who don't believe the slander can see the truth. When we do see Jesus for who he is, and we can have forgiveness for every sin. Every single sin. Not one's left out. Not one is too great for him to handle. He'll cover every sin. He'll make us a part of his own family. You need to ask yourself, do you believe Jesus today? Do you have active living faith in Jesus as a spirit-filled son of God? And if you're not certain, you can be. You can respond to what the Holy Spirit is testifying right now. How he's speaking to your heart right now. And you can actively place your faith and trust in Jesus for forgiveness of sin. And you can be sure of eternal life. I would encourage you as Jeff leads us in a closing song as we spend time in prayer. Commit yourself to the Lord. He is willing to forgive. He wants to forgive. You need to respond. It's available. You can make an excuse again like you've always made before or you can actually respond to the call of the Lord who loves you and lay down his life for you. You can do that right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. Thank you that Jesus is God. Thank you that Jesus did die on the cross for us. And Lord, of all the miracles that he did, the resurrection is the most outstanding. And because he's risen from the grave, there is no doubt that Jesus is exactly who he always claimed to be. He is God, and he offers forgiveness. Lord, I pray for those who have not yet received that offer of forgiveness that Jesus has made. Help them do so right now. Help them, Lord, in their own heart, turn to Jesus in faith, addressing him in prayer, asking Jesus, would you forgive me for those things that I've done? Would you be my Lord and my Savior? Lord, put the words in their heart as they would cry out to you now. Ask to be saved, ask to be made your child. That's your promise from the scriptures, Lord, is that you would make us your children when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So help them reach out by faith and grab hold of the God who reaches out to them. Lord, help us not be deceived. Help us recognize your work for what it is. Thank you, Lord, for your grand promises. Thank you for your great grace. We're amazed by you, Lord Jesus, and we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.